I'm, enjo I'm joined today by an impressive panel of experts from a number of different nations, big and small, with representatives from the consumer movement, regulators and business. Joining me on stage from left to right are John Duffy, CEO of Consumers NZ, the New Zealand consumer organisation, Rocio Concha, Director of Policy and Advocacy and Chief Economist at WITCH, the UK consumer organisation, Patrick Sambao, Head of Practice and Innovation at Mozilla Corporation, Agnieszka doring Shrizhen, Deputy Director at the Polish Office of Competition and Consumer Protection, And we also have a virtual speaker joining us who I will introduce in just a minute. So I'm looking forward to learning from everyone here today. Um, well, the focus of the session will be scams, fraud and fake reviews, but we will look at harms in the digital um, economy more broadly and how we can build digital trust. Before we start the panel discussion with the people on the stage, we're going to hear some brief opening remarks from our virtual speaker, Julie Inman Grant. Julie is Australia's e-safety commissioner, um, and the e-safety commissioner is the world's first regulatory agency committed to keeping its citizens safer, safer online. Julie will be speaking about whether existing consumer protections against digital harms match the lived experiences of people around the world. Thanks, Julie. Uh, thank you so much for having me. Um, great to see you all. Um, it's uh, Thursday evening in Sydney, Sydney, and I'm coming to you from the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. I would love to be with you all in Nairobi, but domestic responsibilities keep me here. Now, 30 years ago, there was a cartoon in the New Yorker magazine famously depicting a dog using a computer. Now, the dog is grinning as he says, on the internet, nobody knows you're a dog. And in some ways, not much has changed. On today's internet, nobody knows you're a gangster posing as a gorgeous young woman seeking to blackmail a naive young man. Nobody knows you're a predator seeking to groom and coerce children into performing sexual acts on their smartphone. The digital world still allows us to craft personas far from our true selves, whether on dating apps, online forums, or social media. What's different now is the sophisticated technologies scammers use to deceive, supercharging a new wave of social engineering fraud and escalating the internet's protect potential for deception and danger. So gone are the days when phishing emails were easily identifiable by their typos and poor grammar. Today, AI-generated versions are much harder to spot. We're now, We're now seeing, seeing voice, voice cloning, cloning, where scammers, scammers use AI, AI to mimic voices from, voices from social media, media clips, clips, tricking, tricking people into revealing sensitive information, information or sending money. money. This adds a sinister new dimension to social engineering because it leverages the trust we have, have in familiar voices. voices. Deep, Deep fakes, fakes once, once only possible, possible with, with massive, massive computing power, power are now, now accessible through consumer apps on our smartphones, like Ninja Journey, Stable Diffusion, and Dolly. Now, these, these apps, apps are being misused, misused by, by children, children to create, to create sexualized, sexualized videos of their, their peers for bullying and harassment. And harassment. We're, We're also seeing chatbots chat capable of grooming or extorting hundreds of young, young people, people simultaneously. simultaneously. And in, in Australia, Australia, we're facing, facing a digital challenge. challenge. A doubling of child sexual abuse material coerced remotely by predators and a threefold increase in sexual extortion reports. Both are social engineering scams that use tried and true techniques. Earlier this year, e-safety investigators found that one in eight child sexual abuse complaints coming to our office involved perpetrators coercing children via webcams and smartphones. This self-generated content is on the rise around the world, and predators use fear or flattery or gifts and guilt to groom and control these children. Our investigators have seen instances where a child is ordered to perform explicit sexual acts while their parents call them for dinner, literally in the next room. So reports of sexual extortion to e-safety have surged threefold over the past year. The vast majority come from young people aged 18 to 24, with 90% being young men. 
Now, many Australians are being blackmailed with threats of sharing our explicit content, leading to significant financial and emotional distress. Scammers typically use social media platforms like Instagram or Snapchat to contact victims using explicit fake content to gain trust. These ruthless criminals often target those who comply with escalating demands. And I have no doubt the Australian experience mirrors what is happening around the world. In fact, I saw one scenario of an American teenager who was approached online by an attractive blonde for a sexy chat. And within one hour, he'd convinced him to perform sexual acts over the webcam. It was immediately capped or screen captured and the dialogue instantly turned menacing and aggressive. Asking for sums of money he didn't have and threatening to share uh, these into, this intimate imagery with his family members and girlfriend, he felt so distressed and so totally cornered within four hours of this initial contact. Now, I assure you, this is a global epidemic driven by organized criminals, but also enabled by technology platforms who are not hardening their defenses or using a safety by design mindset. By neglecting to address well-known offender methodologies or targeting that low-hanging fruit, like thousands of the same fake profile pictures being used to target young men, these companies are literally enabling the colonization of large-scale criminal activity on their platforms. So what must we do at a global level to protect consumers from scams, frauds, and fakes? Obviously, I'm sure you've talked about it uh, much the first day. Two things, educating consumers, and improving the state of online safety. We must enhance our digital skills and resilience, particularly our critical reasoning skills, especially for those who are more vulnerable due to lack of, due, due to trust or lack of technology proficiency. It's crucial for all of us to pause, think and act wisely online. As parents, we must be vigilant, talking to our children about stranger danger that now exists online. We must, we must educate young people, especially men, about the risks of sexual extortion, often, often perpetrated by oh, these, these organized, organized criminals using fake, fake accounts. accounts. And the, and the industry, industry too must step, step up, up and make the digital world a place we trust, us, not, not a place, place we fear. fear. The, the Hippocratic Oath of Governing, governing the Global Medical Profession starts, starts with the adage, first, do, do no harm. By the, by the same, same token, safety. safety by, by design sets, sets out online, online safety, safety standards, standards akin, akin to those we have for cars, pharmaceuticals, pharmaceuticals or, food. or food. It, it urges tech firms, firms to understand the dangers and mitigate those risks, to build, to build in protections at the start, and to, and to ensure, ensure, ensure that globally these safety standards are consistent. In, in all, all of these fields, we understand that early and comprehensive safety integration benefits both people and business. This, this approach is especially protective of vulnerable groups like children. In, in any civil society, everyone has the right to safe goods, quality services, fair treatment, and redress when things go wrong. And this holds true in both our physical and digital lives as they are now intertwined. So much of our existence is online. It's where we work, learn, shop, connect, and seek love. That is why the need for online safety is so urgent. We need to build a digital uh, and resilient future, and we must design our technology with safety at its core, unlocking its full potential for everyone. Thank you. A big thank you to Julie for those insights, which um, I think really nicely set the scene for our discussion today by highlighting the, the breadth of the harms that can be experienced in um, the digital world. Um, we're going to focus the rest of the discussion today on scams and fraud and fake reviews. We'll be exploring three, three, three key themes together. What are the different nations and organisations, what are different nations and organisations doing to address scams and fraud and fake reviews? What's working in the fight against scams, fraud and fake reviews and what are the lessons learned so far? And how can we work together to drive global responses to these global problems? On that final point, I'm excited to share that at the end of this session, I'll be announcing the launch of a global action by a number of Consumers International members, but you'll have to wait until the end for that. 
Online scams and fraud, as well as fake reviews, are global problems, yet different nations and organisations are at different stages in tackling these problems. So we wanted to start the discussion today by giving everyone on the panel a few minutes to give the audience a sense of where they're up to in their nation and their organisation. So Agnieszka, I'll start with you. What's the Polish Office of Competition and Consumer Protection's current perspective on scams, fraud and fake reviews? Um, thank you, Rosie. Um, um, our perspective uh, in Poland is so that the scam is rather... The, uh, can you hear me? Yes, it's better. A uh, scam is rather the, pers uh, the matter of criminal law. Of course, we cooperate, we deliver uh, some evidence when we have uh, to police, for example. Uh, but uh, we don't have uh, administrative tools to, to deal with it. Uh, what we can do uh, uh, under our law is uh, um, dealing with fake reviews. Uh, in, um, uh, in the aspect of fake reviews, we have uh, a lot of uh, administrative proceedings. Uh, it's very important to uh, uh, remember that we have to cover the whole market. Uh, I mean that uh, not only the uh, one, oh, it's better. Um, we control um, from the perspective of using unfair uh, term, um, abusive terms uh, of contracts. Uh, we control uh, the using practices uh, infringing collective interests of uh, consumers. Um, and this is very um, interesting and important thing uh, related with, uh, with fake reviews that there are many actors uh, uh, that are involved in this, uh, um, uh, in this action. Uh, we have those who uh, deliver uh, fake reviews, opinion brokers. We have also those who buy, uh, buy them. Uh, we have uh, uh, platforms uh, which um, organize the space where uh, reviews uh, could be um, posted. Uh, and th this is also uh, uh, one aspect more. Uh, platforms uh, very often are the place where uh, opinion brokers and those who buy them meet and exchange, you know, they do the business on those platforms. Uh, we have also consumers who um, who deliver uh, reviews which are um, sometimes not uh, fake but incentivized so it is also the important uh, issue to have them labeled properly. Uh, so in all those uh, areas we have our proceedings. Um, to better know the, uh, the market, uh, we also had the uh, consumer survey and uh, uh, what, is, what was very interesting, uh, most of consumers who gave uh, their answers said they, that they provide uh, um, reviews. But on the other hand, they are afraid of that, that they, are, uh, they know that some of them are uh, fake, but they don't know how to, uh, how to distinguish those who are uh, real and those who are, uh, and these who are, uh, which are um, uh, uh, fake. So, um, in result, they are afraid of, uh, of um, reading, of making decision, uh, depending on those uh, re reviews. So this is, uh, it shows that uh, this is a very important uh, uh, matter for uh, consumers uh, who, um, who, of course, um, um, buy many things uh, uh, on internet, but on the other hand, they, they are afraid of those, all those threats that they can meet. Thank you. Thank you, Agnieszka. It's really valuable to have the sort of regulator perspective here on the panel. Patrick, we might turn to you. Um, what's the Mozilla Corporation's perspective on these issues? Um, <clears throat> thank you for that. Uh, allow me to start by maybe giving a short impression of what, what we believe in, um, you know, as, as a company. So, number one, uh, we believe in an internet that is open. Number two, an internet that is accessible to anybody, irrespective of race, religion, caste, or whatever it is. But most importantly, um, an internet or cyberspace that is trustworthy. And therefore, then everything we do, or our actions, product delivery, product um, collaborations, 
are anchored on two principles, uh, security uh, and privacy. And, and therefore then this is reflected on, um, on our product. So if you look at Firefox, we're very big on privacy and security. If you look at uh, Fixport, which I'll discuss later on, we're big on those two aspects. Therefore then it's a, it's a conversation or an engagement that is right down our alley. It's our bread and butter. It's what we do every day, uh, keeping consumers um, and users of the internet uh, safe online and protecting them from, um, you know, from these threats. But most importantly, we do that um, in two ways. The first way is through awareness creation, exposing um, these risks, uh, the, you know, the existence of these risks to, to potential users or existing users of our products. And number two is creating tools that consumers can then use to mitigate the risks that, that, that come or that exist. And, and, and by tools, I mean, uh, I, th I think I just mentioned uh, Firefox itself is a tool, Fixport is a tool, and other products that, that we have. Thank you. Rocio, the UK is sort of leading the world when it comes to regulation to protect against online scams and fake review. What's Witch's current perspective and how do you feel about these issues? Thank you, Rossi. Um, Can you hear me? Yes. Um, and I say first, good morning. And it's brilliant to be here with so many consumers advocate business that will do the right thing for consumers and other NGOs. You can feel the energy in the room. Um. Thank you. Much better. So as I said, you can feel the energy in the room. And it's great to be here because to discuss this uh, a very important subject. So uh, the UK uh, have a big problem with fake reviews and scams. We have been described to be the capital of the world for scams. I will focus on scams now because we have already talked a little bit about fake reviews, but over the conversation that we are going to have, I will be uh, also sharing the perspectives on fake reviews. But just to give you a, a sense of the scale of the problem in the UK, in 2022, we lost around 1.7 billion on scams. So it has been a big priority for us to um, work with the government to make sure that the right regulations are put in place so businesses that are being used by these criminals to get to all of us take responsibility for this. And we have made good progress. We now have the banks um, taking some responsibility for some of the scams that happen via some payments, push payments scams and also the online platform having a duty to do more, to put measures to prevent that scams getting to us. But this has been a number of years for us to get to where we are today. So I just wanted to share with you what we have learned from that. First, the impact of scams is not only financial. And many of, know, of us know that it's emotional. But one of the challenges that we had to, uh, to make that case to the government and to businesses is that people don't, sometimes don't understand unless you put a monetary value to things. So we actually did a study that put a, a monetize what was the impact on well-being. And our um, analysis uh, show that the annual impact on well-being of scams is 9.3 billion. So much higher even than the financial impact. The other thing that uh, we learn is that a large part of these scams start online. And many of them go via uh, pay for advertising online. So uh, criminals put fake companies, fake ads, and then they pay the online platforms to get it to us, to, put, uh, to get our eyeballs. The other thing that we learn is that it's a very profitable business. Criminals can make a lot of money by doing this. So one study that was done in the UK shows that in one day, one post made 800,000 pounds. So what you will expect, you will expect a lot of criminals going to this. The other thing that we learned is that education is not the answer. So we do quite a lot on educating consumers. We have a scam alert service that uh, anyone that subscribes to it will get a, a heads up when we discover a new scam. But that is not enough because as we have been discussing over the conference in many of the panels, this is getting very sophisticated. 
can happen to any of us, any of us that are already working on this. These are very credible. They are very organized crime that is behind all these scams. And with generative AI, it's going to get worse. The other thing that we uh, learn is that unless we focus on prevention, we are not going to solve this problem. And what does that mean? That means that those companies that are being used by these criminals to get to us have to take responsibility. Who are these companies? Banks, online platforms, and also uh, telecoms. The final thing that we learn, voluntary measures are not going to get us there. The scale of the problem is so big and we need regulation. And that is where we are in the UK. We finally now getting in regulation in terms of the online platforms and the banks, but there is a lot more to do and I'm welcome you know, to have a discussion about this uh, in the panel today. Thank you. Thank you, Rocio. So there's a lot more to do, but John, from where you sit in New Zealand, how do you feel about where the UK is sitting um, compared to New Zealand? Thank you. Uh, thanks, Rosie, um, and thank you very much for, for having me along. It's, um, it's, it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, I listen to, to what Rossi has described, and I hear the problems that she's highlighting, and I, I am jealous. The UK is so far ahead of where New Zealand is currently. Um, we are, I think we've been quite lucky for many years. We're a small country right at the bottom of the world and have been relatively... Um, we've, we've always had a level of, of scamming and, and fraud, but we've been kind of overlooked. That has all changed in the last 18 months, and we've been hit with an absolute tsunami of scamming, which has hit um, a populace that is not hardened to detecting um, and protecting themselves. Uh, so I'm very interested in the comments around education. Uh, we do need a level of education, but actually... We've, the tsunami has also hit industry that has spent 10 years not preparing for the tsunami. They've seen it coming in other jurisdictions, but have done nothing in New Zealand to harden uh, our payments infrastructure and our, our, our front-end banking systems. Uh, our telcos, while doing an adequate job, is, uh, are really only doing an adequate job, and our online platforms, is, is probably as repeated across the globe, are not doing enough to... Uh, protect their customers, remove fake reviews, fraudulent ads, um, and, and you know, put brick walls in place to, pr to protect the populace. Um, I, I've been lucky enough in my career to work um, at, at our competition regulator in New Zealand, at our privacy regulator. I'm now a consumer advocate, but uh, I also spent eight years regulating the largest, or as head of trust and safety at the largest e-commerce marketplace in New Zealand. And I can say firsthand from inside uh, that walled garden that with the right will and the right um, desires, platforms can take a more active role in preventing listings uh, that are fraudulent, preventing reviews that are fake. They can alert for them, they can detect them, and they can take responsibility for them when they've missed the opportunity to prevent them coming into contact with their customers. And I think, uh, uh, just in my closing opening remarks, I'd, I'd, I'd leave us with the idea that, yes, scammers are making enormous amounts of money of victims, but the platforms and the banks and the telcos are also making money through this process. And there needs to be a degree of accountability with com that comes with that profitability. And I'd be very interested in discussing that more. Thank you, John. I think that's a really good point. And we've got lots of smart people in the room. And if there is any way that we can quantify how much money, for example, the social media platforms are making from scam ads, I think that would be a very powerful contribution to um, these discussions happening globally. So next, I want to sort of talk about some of the specifics and get into a bit more detail about the regulation that's coming in the UK. So the Online Safety Act and the Digital Markets Competition and Consumer bill. I think it's still a bill. Is that correct? Yes. Yep. <laughs> um, Rocio, how will these laws help with preventing scams and fake reviews and what are the lessons that other countries should take from them? Yes. So let's start with the Online Safety Act. This is a very new act. It took us years to get to here. 
and we are now implementing it. So what is the Online Safety Act does? It put a duty on online platforms, in particular search engines and um, social media platforms, to put measures in place to prevent criminals using their platforms to get to us. Now, even if you put measures in place, some uh, criminals, because as I said, they are very innovative and very organized, may get through those measures. So they also have a duty to remove that uh, anything that is looked like a fraudulent advertising from the platforms uh, quickly. So this is currently being implemented in the UK. Uh, the regulator is now developing some code of practice to make sure that the online platforms actually comply with this. So that is where we are with online uh, platforms. The uh, Digital Markets Competition and Consumer Bill is a separate bill, and that bill deals or gives the opportunity to deal with fake reviews. It's a still a bill in Parliament. There is a still discussions and consultation about what exactly we are going to regulate on fake reviews. Our position is that uh, the sell, the hosting, and the buying of fake reviews should be a banned practice. So from our, in the UK, we have the consumer protection regulations, so it should be included in the banned practice to, make a, to be a criminal activity. So the UK has taken some important steps forward, but what does that mean for the rest of us? And um, the, Because this is a global problem. John, you're trying to tackle these problems from a relatively small con country, and what's your perspective on how we need to move forward internationally? Thank you. Um, yes, yeah, so we are a relatively small country, uh, population of five and a half million. Um, I think uh, uh, stepping back from that, just responding to some of your comments, Rossia, I mean, if we just stop and question for a second how we've got to a situation where countries like the UK, and I'm sure m many of the jurisdictions represented here will be, will be thinking along the same lines, why are we having to pass laws to stop platforms facilitating fraud. They should be taking responsibility for stopping this themselves. And of course, the platforms will argue, yes, they're doing lots and they've got big trust and safety teams and they're taking ads down, but it's a function of scale. They can't possibly get to everything. But they're damn well making a profit on all of those ads. So if they can, they can sort it out so that they can make money off it, they should have responsibility for dealing with the consequences when those ads are fraud. And I, I find it really problematic that, that lawmakers have to actually step in here and regulate these markets because they've been left to regulate themselves and it hasn't worked. What was your original question, Rosie? Sorry, I got, <laughs> I got on my high horse there. No, I, I agree wholeheartedly. <laughs> so it was very good intervention. Um, I suppose the, where I was hoping to take the discussion is, you know, the UK have taken some steps, but... You know, that doesn't really help in New Zealand. It doesn't help in Australia, other than we can point to an example. So well, what does that mean? Well, I think that's important to, to say, hey, here's, a, here's a, a guiding light, an example that we can point to to put pressure on our regulators to, um, to do a better job and actually to put pressure on industry to say, well, unless you pull your socks up and do better, regulation like this could, could come down the pipeline. Personally, I absolutely agree. <coughs> a voluntary approach is not enough. We've... These are not new issues, right? We've, we've, been, we've had um, digital banking for 15 to 20 years. Um, banks, for just using banks as one example, I know there, there, there are plenty of other industries that are involved in this, but you know, banks have used the digitization of banking to pull, to take efficiency, to pull cost out of their business, to increase their margins. And, and just for context, the four most profitable companies in the economy of New Zealand are the four biggest banks, right, by, by a significant margin, um, which is problematic in of itself, and there's currently a market study looking at, at why that's the case. Um, but, yeah, I, I think there needs to be a nexus between that profitability and the efficiencies that have been gained by closing bank branches, getting rid of checks, pushing everybody to their apps, um, shrinking call centres so that there's not 
humans answering phones anymore. All of these things are good. I'm not criticizing businesses for being efficient. They're profiting from that. There has to be a, 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 a corresponding effort to protect people th um, from the harms that come through the, um, the mechanisms that you're now making them engage with you on. That's, I guess that's my point. Just, just to build on what, um, how, what is happening in the UK can help other jurisdictions. Well, if the online platforms are putting measures in place in the UK, that means that they can put it globally. So there is no excuse. Uh, absolutely. And I think that's one of the things we've seen at Choice, looking at the policies of these platforms. They'll have different policies in different countries. And so you sort of wonder, why are you switching on the technology in some places, but not others? And we suspect it relates to the regulation or the political pressure and all of that. I think in Australia, one thing we've definitely noticed, slightly bigger than New Zealand, still not that big in the grand scheme of things, um, the, those tech giants just don't really take the Australian government that seriously. They're not coming to the table. They're not particularly paying attention. And so even if we get the laws over the line, unless the penalties are substantial, there's a real question about whether or not they'll take them seriously. Um, so I think that's another perspective um, worth sharing. Um, so we've spoken a bit about scams. So perhaps we shift to fake reviews now. Um, I think the harm from scams and f is really hard to understand, but it's not, it's, sorry, it's really easy to understand, um, but it's not always clear what the harm from fake reviews are. Um, Agneska, what harms are consumers experiencing from fake reviews? Uh, from fake reviews, uh, consumers uh, put the, um, the harms uh, the, that uh, consumers experience um, because of fake reviews, scams, and uh, other um, activities uh, that uh, um, that are not convenient for for consumers uh, are very heavy, and they are uh, from uh, various uh, sorts. We can uh, say uh, the most uh, obvious uh, are, of course, uh, economic uh, uh, economical harms, financial, but the, the, those are not the only uh, only one. Uh, I uh, I um, could say that um, except uh, those financial harms, we uh, can also have uh, psychological harms uh, uh, because uh, uh, consumers uh, don't feel safe when uh, when they realize that they uh, were cheated. Um, so um, they don't don't believe uh, to, to to platforms to uh, sellers uh, traders on uh, on internet. So they don't feel safe uh, when they are um, buying some products. Um, so they. Uh, uh, they do not optimal choices uh, for them. They buy too expensive things the, with the um, quality that is not uh, um, uh, good for them. Uh, they feel misle misled. Um, so the harms are really, really wide for them. Thank you. And I think I saw a study recently trying to quantify the harm from fake reviews. Rossio. Yes, so again, that was a problem when we started talking about fake reviews, then um, we got that question, well, what, what is the harm of fake reviews? So again, we went and did a study, did a behavioral study uh, in one particular platform, because we are a consumer organization that tests products, we have don't buys, so we use the don't buys with uh, fake reviews that actually were online, and see how that affects the people making decisions. And we, um, the study show that it's twice, uh, when you have fake reviews, twice as likely, it's twice as likely that you will buy something that is faulty. So they are very effective in manipulating people in buying things that are no fit for purpose for them. So we've spoken a lot about the role of regulation and governments. So I'm interested in hearing about the role for business in mitigating harms from scams and fake review. Patrick, did you want to start this discussion? Yeah, yeah, truly. Um, we're a business that is, I'd say we're a channel through which all of these things happen. Like we're a window or a door through where people come in. 
And therefore, we bear a very heavy responsibility to ensure that then our platform um, is not used uh, or is not a safe home for the perpetrators of, of all of these things. And so we do that both um, uh, in awareness, as I said earlier, um, educating consumers about you know, that these threats exist and, and technically as well in ensuring that um, some of these uh, perpetrators uh, are spotted uh, even before they are let into the cyberspace. Uh, so we stop it, and, and, I, and I like that you said prevention is a key, and therefore then we try to prevent them from getting into our ecosystem um, and publishing whatever it is um, that they do. But most importantly is that we ensure that whoever comes in through our ecosystem, number one, um, is transparent. We know who they are, we know where they're coming from, because transparency builds trust, uh, and trust is the foundation uh, through which uh, sustainable ecosystems are built. And therefore then it's important for us to recognize and bear that responsibility that if we play our role, then the consumer will get the right products, they will be protected from all of these things, um, and they will have a safe, healthy ecosystem uh, for all, for everybody. Yep. Rocio, John, did, do you want to respond or add anything further? Um, I mean, I think that's a laudable attitude, and I think putting my previous hat as a regulator of an online marketplace, I'll just repeat the point that actually just comes down to what you're willing to invest. You know, all the, all the, the mechanisms are there to stop the vast majority of um, scam ads, fake reviews, that sort of thing, if you're willing to invest the time, the people, and the money into implementing those systems. Um, or there will always be a percentage that sneaks through and, and that is because um, unlike some industries scammers are extremely innovative they're constantly, you know, they're constantly upping their game and um, there will always be a bit of a lag as a new thing comes along that's understandable, I think there's a tolerance for that um, but for the, for the bulk of known um, fraud vectors or scam vectors um, businesses should be able to prevent the majority of them with the appropriate level of investment. I also think it's important, when we're talking about the tech giants, these are the companies with the best technology in the world. Like, they've got the resources and technology to do everything. And so, if we don't put the responsibility on them, you know, the, the notion that consumers can kind of protect themselves against these sophisticated criminal syndicates is, is sort of... We're really focusing on the wrong part of the problem. Um, so, we, Patrick, I might come back to you to just focus on specifically how technology can help combat digital um, scams and fake reviews. Yeah, thank you, Rose. So, and, and I did like my co-panel sentiments on businesses should invest in that. So we're already doing that. And specifically, uh, we recently acquired, not so recently, acquired a business known as... Uh, it's an application, it's known as fake spots. So it's basically a platform that enables you to query further the reviews of products. So it's available for eBay, Amazon, and others. So it uses AI and, mach and machine learning to review uh, or flesh out reviews and determine for you um, which ones are true, which ones are not, and also gives you a rating of that, pro a true rating or a true reflection of that product. So by the time you're purchasing or taking an action to purchase that product, you have fair judgment on what that product is. Um, and of course, goes into what you spoke about, uh, you know, you spoke about investing. Now, um, Rose, you also said that, you know, scammers are now sophisticated. Uh, so part of it is, we are every day enhancing our technology, um, AI, machine learning, uh, to learn more patterns because it's ever evolving. So once we build what we had in the first version, we already begin seeing them trying to you know, game, this, game the, the system. And so we are ever in competition with them. And I'd like to, be co to say that we're cognizant of the fact that we're dealing with very sophisticated um, uh, people. They're, therefore, it's an everyday journey uh, you know, to put in efforts invest um, to, to, you know, to fight against some of these things happening. But overall, uh, 
technology has a role uh, to play. But my, my very, very last point is um, we encourage um, interoperability of platforms. So for example, um, Fixport and all other Mozilla products, including Firefox, are open access, meaning that we are open to collaborate with other um, ecosystem players. And when ecosystem players collaborate, technically especially, then we're able to come up with a more cohesive defense uh, of these comers. And, and we, we it definitely then makes the ecosystem more resilient because we, we, we are a stronger force together. Thank you. And can I say that collaboration is key? Um, these criminals no, don't use one platform. They use all platforms. They use uh, also telecoms. So if we really want to win the battle, we need to share intelligence within these companies and regulators to share intelligence about what is happening in their ecosystem. So if there is a particular scamming activity in one, in one uh, ecosystem, there needs to be a system to alert the others because if you block there, they will go to another place. So we really need to be ambitious. We are dealing with very creative and sophisticated people. So to defend us against that, we need to put the same energy and the same innovation um, to fight against that. And it's a continuous fight because they will continue to find new ways and we need to continue, and the companies, the government need to continue finding new ways to defend uh, users and consumers from these scams. So, and, and one of the things that um, surprised me um, <coughs> is that it's a big problem. There is a lot of numbers that show that it's a big problem, but it doesn't seem to be top priority. Why is that? Because who is paying for this? Us, consumers, users, are not the companies. Are not the go it's not the government. So how we can make sure that there are the right incentives there to say, this is a big problem, we need to, you know, we need to work together to try to tackle it. I've got one last question and then I'll open it up to the floor for some Q&A. Um, we focused a lot on prevention today, um, but I think sadly we'll never completely eradicate scams and some will get through. So how do we remediate scam losses and provide justice for consumers when that happens? Who would like to go first? <laughs> well, what we have done in the UK now, we have the banks. The banks will have... I mean, one of the reasons because we see quite a lot of scams in the UK is because we were, I think, one of the first jurisdictions to introduce fast payments. That was a big innovation. And it was not designed with, with bearing in mind that could be exploited by these criminals. And what we have seen is have been exploited. So we are now um, have uh, regulation in place. It used to be a voluntary code. Now it's a regulation because the voluntary code didn't work to make sure that if uh, you are a victim of a push payment scam, the banks have to reimburse you, unless you have been very negligent. negligent. So, and that, guess what? That is putting a lot of incentives on the bank on thinking what we can do to make sure that these consumers are no scam. So it put the right incentive there because they are paying. Um, I think if we're going to properly address the harms, we need to first ad address the narrative that has been pushed, particularly from the uh, banking sector, that this is an education problem, that this is naive consumers being, um, being scammed because they haven't taken the time to educate themselves about the risks of what they're doing. We have to get past that. That is patronising that is victim blaming and it belittles the lived experience of these victims. So uh, once, we're, once we can destroy that narrative and actually accept the idea that we're all in this together, um, but only one of us is making money from it, I think that, that actually reframes the question and goes, well, okay, if we're profiting from this, we should be reinvesting back into, into prevention. And I think the right tool for that, I absolutely agree, is, is putting liability on either the platforms or the banks, um, with the exception that where the, the the scam victim has been, you know, 
ne not just negligent, but you know, tipping a higher bar of negligence, I think, or, or has in some way contributed to the scam, um, then of course I think there should be an off-ramp there. But um, yeah, I think we, we absolutely need to change that narrative because it's still persistent. Yeah, and I think on that one, the, the word scam is a bit unhelpful. It makes it feel like a trivial thing. That's why I like, Rossio, how you talk about criminals because that's what it is. It's financial crime. And so in other areas, you know, we expect banks um, to, you know, they've got obligations in respect of money laundering and terrorism financing. Like there are other areas where we expect businesses to play their part to prevent these global crimes. But for some reason, we're not hol holding them to the same standard when it comes to this example of the global crime, global financial crime. Um, so I'm going to shift to audience Q&A. Um, and so while the mics are coming around, I just want to warn my panellists that um, after the Q&A, I will ask each of you to share the one thing that you have learnt and will take away from this panel going forward. So just putting that on notice. Um, and if I'll just remind everyone in the audience, if you can tell us your name and the organisation you're representing. Thank you, Antonino Serra Cambaceres, Adelco, Argentina. First, about what uh, Rocio mentioned uh, about working together, I think one thing is still very important for this and everything is consumer education. This is a very strong thing that we need to keep going. And I have a question for the panelists. Where do you put uh, two things, so two, one person and one thing? One is influencers on these scams, fraud, and fake reviews. And the second is greenwashing. Thank you. Agnieszka? I can answer uh, to this question. Uh, influencers uh, in our um, uh, jurisdictions, we, uh, um, um, we have administrative proceedings uh, against influencers. It's something uh, similar to fake reviews for us. Uh, so, uh, not a, uh, a scam, for example, in the meaning of criminal law, but administrative law. They, um, we consider that they um, are, are uh, using practices, uh, unfair commercial practices, uh, infringing uh, consumers' uh, interests. And we have also, uh, you mentioned the education. We we have many activities uh, connected with uh, with uh, education uh, directed to consumers, but not only, also to influencers, for example, some guidelines uh, for them. Um, to clarify my point before, I wasn't saying that there isn't a role for education. I think it's extremely important and it should continue. Um, it's just shifting the current narrative that that's the only thing that will, will prevent scamming. Um, hi, I'm Deepthi George. Uh, I work at Dwara Research, uh, which is an organization based in India. I'm on a project where we're trying to actually solve for exactly what, Rosie, you were talking about uh, in terms of uh, authorized push payment uh, based ca scams in the UPI ecosystem. Um, and uh, so I think the question uh, is two things, uh, twofold. One, of course, it's great that for very small ticket frauds, which, uh, which there's absolutely not enough capacity in the ecosystem to actually undertake a full investigation, uh, it makes sense to have liability being placed right up front on financial institutions, which are mostly banks uh, or the platforms or a combination of both. Uh, but I'm very curious to know what is the nature of, uh, like, so in the, the new regulation that has come out in the UK, Negligence, the, the burden of proof to prove that customer was negligent is on the bank, but that is still gameable, right? So I'm just very curious to know to what extent can that go? Well, I, I have to say that this is a area of a huge debate at the moment in the UK, because what we have now is the legislation, but now the regulator is implementing that legislation. At that point, is exactly uh, an area that is being debated at the moment. Um, what is, how you prove that someone has been grossly negligent is the issue. Um, from our point of view, the bar has to be quite high to demonstrate that you have been grossly negligent. Um, and the clear evidence has to be provided by the banks that that have been the case and they have put all the measures in place to prevent that scam happening. Hi, um, it's uh, Michael from Hong Kong Consumer Council. Um, I'd like to understand more about the um, measures that would be imposed on online platforms uh, to comply. 
uh, because currently, as I understand, um, they already have um, policies in place, right? So if you find an infringing uh, mark or you find a scam, uh, you can actually report them uh, by the business. Um, so I'd like to understand more about those. Yeah. Um, the Hong Kong situation is actually quite similar to everywhere else, essentially. Um, this is not only about reporting, it's about preventing. So I think that what is different with the Online Safety Act, that they are now have a duty to put measures in place to prevent scammers user, using their ecosystem to get to us. Reporting, many of them are doing some reporting. Sometimes uh, there are different ways to report. Sometimes you as a consumer report and you don't know what happened. You don't know what that data is going to prevent others to be victims of that scam. So what the law is put in is a clear framework where they have to show that they have put the right measures in place to prevent and so we have to see whether they are preventing and the level of scams happening in their ecosystems. They need to put also the measures in place to when it is reported immediately to be taken down again that is putting the bar higher, and they need to demonstrate that they are doing that, and they need to put measures in place, clear measures in place for reporting. So that is why it's different. And what is also different is that the regulator will be monitoring that this is happening and making sure that you know they, they are enforcing this, uh, this new regulation. Does that answer your question? And I just, I'll add one point on reporting. I mean, my team has been reporting the ads regularly. We will find the same ad there or the same advertising, another likely scam ad days later. So that doesn't seem... And then we, we actually met with one of the tech platforms and their advice to us was just keep reporting. Um, they're telling us that's... Um, if my team of staff, people doing this alongside advocating in lots of other areas um, can find the scam ads and report them, why can't the companies with the best technology in the world figure, that, figure it out themselves? Um, sorry, I'm a very bad moderator. <laughs> uh, good morning uh, to the panellist. Uh, yeah, this is Akshay Yadav uh, from National Law School of India, University of Bangalore. Uh, with respect to the fake reviews, like uh, last year we did a research on the fake reviews wherein uh, there are m many fake reviews which are going around and India came up with uh, Indian, uh, like the standard, Bureau of Indian Standards on online consumer reviews, uh, adhering to the standards that ISO has. And based on that, uh, now we are regulating the uh, fake reviews in India. But there are uh, there are a lot of errors with respect to the uh, the, the standards prescribes two uh, steps of moderations, uh, automated mo moderation as well as a manual moderation. Uh, it mandates. But when we look after the errors that uh, automated ma uh, mandate has, there are a lot of ma errors. And uh, in that scenario, uh, on whom we should uh, set the liability? So that's the one uh, first question I have. The second question is, uh, there are, uh, the companies are hiring the anonymous uh, authority and through that anonymous authority, they are approaching many poor people who are, uh, who are in search of jobs, uh, they, are, they are approaching and they are providing uh, huge money uh, to, the, uh, to such people uh, for providing the fake reviews. So this, these are the couple of questions and in that scenario, with whom we should, again the liability, we should impose and uh, with respect to the social media guidelines uh, so uh, we have came up with the guidelines on social media influencers now which is regulating the endorsement uh, and this is what i wanted to bring to you thank you can i make sure that i understand your your first question you you are saying that there are some measures that are being put in place to deal with fake reviews, but some of them are not working well. And where should be the liability for that? Well, the people hosting those fake reviews. So they are the ones that are putting the measures in place. The measures in place are not working, so you better put new measures in place to make sure that they are working. So to me, it's quite clear there have to be the um, platforms that host the fake reviews. Uh, 
Maybe I could add uh, how uh, what is our attitude to this issue. Uh, we, if we have a company uh, which uh, uh, has um, uh, which uh, offers uh, those fake reviews, uh, uh, this company is the is the party of our administrative proceedings. We don't we are not looking for those people who, uh, in fact. Uh, are uh, writing those uh, fake reviews um, if they are working for the company. What? Uh, but what is also important, uh, at what is uh, a little bit similar to the criminal law, uh, we don't um, um, have fines only for the company, but also for managers. So this is the responsibility of those who organize all this, uh, this procedure. Yes, so just to clarify, I mean, the, the law, <laughs> have to affect the people buying, the sellers, and the people hosting it. I think your question was on the measures that platform, the platform that hosts that are not working. And that, that is why I said that should be the hosting platform. OK, thank you very much. Uh, the panel, uh, Chimera Henry, I work with Consent, Consumer Center. I find that the discussion is quite rich. And uh, I love the aspect that you raised forget the scam, fraud, and, and just call it criminality. And uh, that is something very good. And listening in, it shows a little of gaps in regards to the flameworks. The devout world has very good instruments in place, but still they are facing the scams. Now, all the criminality. Now, the developing world still are crawling to that level of getting the flameworks in place. So. This shows that whether one is a naive or educated consumer, everyone and everybody is a potential victim. Having said that, I wish to wrap it up mainly for the developing world. The different regulators need to work together, build their capacities to build trust in the digital economy. The consumers, once they run to the regulator where they think to get hope, and they find that the regulators have no capacity to help them, then the trust will not be there. Then the last aspect that I find that the regulators, after collaborating and needing to build their capacities, they need to reach out continuously. You've raised it, but the reaching out to the consumers will need to be constant, not a one-off campaign, but continuous campaigns to build their capacities. Thank you. Good morning, Chiso, Consumer Advocacy and Empowerment Foundation, Nigeria. In all the conversations, I, I heard when, when you said that the well-being effect of this was over nine billion. I have not seen anybody trying to educate the scammers on the effects of their actions. A lot of these scammers from conversations I've had, don't they really, they know what they're doing is wrong, but they don't really understand the impact. And when you begin to break down the impact of their actions, not all of them is going to say, I'm gonna back off. What I find out that some of them, they sit back and said, oh, because I'm not using a gun, I'm not holding a bat over your head, they don't, they say, I'm just, I'm, I'm fast, I, you know, this is a, a job for me. But when they begin to understand the impact on the well-being of, the, of their actions, it actually changes the minds of some of the scammers. It's, a, it's psychology. So we have to also try and build in showing victim impact showing it to them. I had a neighbor in Boston that lost her house and she was handicapped. She lost her living from this impact, from this fraud that was come that came to her from UK. And I was and I said, nobody has really showed them the the impact of some of their actions. And I think we need to build it in in our awareness and education. We need to build this into it. It might affect 10%, but that's 10% we have converted. 
Can I just comment on that? I, I, th I think that's a really interesting point, um, but we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that a significant amount of scamming is coming out of jurisdictions where people are being trafficked into scamming. They, they're not there by choice. They're indentured. Um, they're, you know, they're, they're subjugated to, to, to violence and, and are kept in compounds against their will and forced to um, push scams out. So it's organised criminal gangs that you'd be needing to educate in that, in that example and y your ability to be effective there might, it might be questionable. I don't know. They know exactly what they're doing, I think, and they know how profitable it is. Um, yeah, you're right, you might affect 10%, but um, th these are big sophisticated operations, uh, transnational operations. Uh, I would like to uh, add uh, something to, um, uh, to those who uh, uh, you said. Uh, I agree that the education is a, is a key uh, point. Uh, we don't have um, educational campaigns on scams directed to, uh, to business, but to consumers, yes. But uh, I would like to mention uh, about the educational uh, campaigns on fake reviews, uh, which are, uh, were um, um, conducted um, among uh, um, enforcement agencies worldwide uh, um, in the ISPAN uh, net and uh, we worked uh, out uh, guidelines for business on fake reviews uh, how to how to label uh, what is wrong and how to how to uh, um, properly act uh, in this uh, in this area and uh, um, starting from this uh, point um, s s it had uh, influenced uh, uh, also uh, companies. So yes, this is very important to, to, to educate um, people how to behave on the market. Okay, thank you. My name is Queen Munyai. I'm from the Consumer Goods and Services Ombud in South Africa. So we mediate complaints between consumers and suppliers. And per annum we receive about 12,000 complaints. So since COVID, we've seen that uh, consumers have changed behavior. We ha before COVID, we had about of the complaints that we received, the two, only 2% two amounted to online transactions. But since then, we've seen that it's, we've seen a spike. They're now at about 34% above to complaints that relate to online uh, purchases. So we use several, we have identified, we use that platform or that process of complaints handling to identify what is happening, even the scams that are happening through those platforms. So the, the te techniques that we have used, because of our limited uh, jurisdiction and all the powers that we have, we have used naming and shaming. We issue alerts to consumers and we publish and we talk to journalists and everybody that reports on that which helps the other consumers to learn and to avoid using those uh, suppliers. We've also used awareness and collaboration with other platforms or other uh, services like your fraud prevention platforms and all that. But what has been a challenge is that part of our role is to facilitate or mediate and facilitate redress for consumers. So we've, we've seen challenges in trying to get the monies back into the hands of the consumers because when we uh, try to engage with banks, we are not able to get them to, because we are able to see that some of the monies have been transferred using bank accounts, but we are not able to get one, we are not able to pull down those platforms the online platforms wherein the scammers are using and collecting money and never uh, delivering whatever that they have promised. And secondly, to get the money back. So I would, it will be interesting to know how other countries are managing that to get bankers on board to try and recover for those monies and also to pull down the, the platforms or the websites in which consumers are being scammed. Thank you. Rossio, John, did one of you want to respond? So, um, how, you, how we have done it, we try to have conversations with the platforms, with the banks, 
to put uh, for them to put measures in place that didn't work. So what well, we've some have put some measures, but not at the scale that is necessary to deal with the problem. <clears throat> that is why we focus on government and regulation, because we reach a point where we thought this is not going, this is not working. Uh, there is a lot of positive talk, but no real actions, because what we are seeing is scams are increasing, and you, what you can see is the more that we move online and the world is moving online the more you will see problems uh, of this type and more victims of the scams. So from my perspective, um, you need the government, you need the regulators to actually put the right, the right regulations in place. Patrick? Uh, oh, oh, sorry, Patrick. You. Go ahead. No, I just wanted to throw in that you raise a very critical point, and it hits me that while regulators have jurisdiction, scammers do not have jurisdiction, and so you're competing at very, very different um, levels. And in this calls for open standards um, in terms of reporting, because I've had a lot of, I've had people saying there's a lot of, uh, you know, who do you report to? So perhaps open standard framework that then gets countries, organizations, and people to report to that, sort of like uh, what is done with the credit reference bureaus. And it works, I think, really perfectly. Uh, until we get to that point, I, I think we're really going to have, um, you know, this challenge will persist for as long as they are not operating under any jurisdiction. They can move money from here, one country to the other, but the regulators only operate within a certain jurisdiction. Thank you. Go ahead, please. Um, I was just going to add that uh, it's been raised before, but this collaboration point is an important one. And I know there's a number of jurisdictions that are, uh, have either set up or are looking at anti scam centres which bring industry in some cases NGOs, but also enforcement agencies together so that information can be shared. So to answer your point, you know, an internet service provider can stop access to a website that's perpetrating fraud. Um, th that is within their powers, and if they're, if they're co-located with, let's say, the police in, a, in an anti-scam centre, the police can say, we agree that there are grounds there, let's... Let's do that, and you, you might need a warrant to do that, potentially or not, but you could fast track that if that information's been shared. At the moment, the telcos are doing their own thing, the banks are doing their own thing, the platforms well, might be doing something, who knows, um, and, and the government's over here doing its own thing, this, uh, just speaking in the New Zealand um, context. Um, bringing all of those together, and I know the Australians are thinking about that as well, and the Singaporeans are the, kind of the leading example of that at the moment. Um, could and I would hope would have an impact. I, I might just share the Australian National Anti-Scam Centre experience um, with ad scam ads, particularly the ads um, imitating popular retailers in Australia. Um, we've seen, with Black Friday and Christmas, we're seeing a kind of growth in this. Very interestingly, our National Anti-Scam Centre, which sits within our Competition and Consumer Protection Regulator, what they've said is that the easiest they find if they contact the platforms to take the ads down, nothing happens. But if the retailer contacts the platform to take the ads down, they'll get taken down. And so I think when you think about that, that's interesting. The client who is probably genuinely advertising on your platform will get the attention, not the regulator. Hey. Next. Yeah, uh, good morning. This is Maximilian from the Mexican organization TechCheck. Um, so the, the panel leaves me with a lot of doubts, but in a, in a positive way, I'm not sure if we always can only blame the platforms and where do we start. Um, because what we face, at least in Mexico, is there's a pure anarchy in social media. Uh, they can do whatever they want to, and especially influencers, but also advertisement uh, companies. And so my question would rather be, or do we need to change the focus? Do we need to change and next time talk about real reviews? reviews? How can we focus as consumer organizations to share the information that consumers really need? Do we really need to focus a panel on all the anarchy and all the bad things that are happening and where we actually do not have a chance to control it? Because I am convinced that we can do a lot of things on the regulator side, uh, but at the end of the day, because the internet, and that's a big advantage of the internet, it, there, there's a huge anonym, what we, we, we can remain anonymous, uh, and many do so for their criminal activities. Um, but so my suggestion would be next time, talk about real reviews and how we promote this kind of information, how we can cooperate with different platforms. Because on the corporate side, 
it is obvious that the platforms have the, the real and good platforms, the real and good retailers have an interest in no scam, no fraud, and real reviews, because then we trust in the digital economy and we will make more purchases on these kind of platforms. So I, I would like to know if there are any kind of good practices from New Zealand or Australia, where you guys, how do you, because from which we know that you guys review uh, products and you share that kind of information. But for example, in Mexico, I would not know a single web page that I could consult to get real reviews about certain products. I wouldn't even believe in the authorities uh, at this stage. So that would be my question, thanks. So both Consumer NZ and Choice run the same model as which, so we are regularly providing genuine expert-based reviews on, I don't know, your next washing machine purchase or something like that, but you have stumbled across, I think, something that's going to be discussed uh, on Friday, which is the, the dying model of traditional consumer organisations where people do not want to, that, that costs a lot of money to produce, it's guaranteed as genuine, but people don't want to pay for it anymore. They want to trust the Wild West that is the internet. And look, there are genuine reviews out there. Um, it would be counter to the revenue model of traditional consumer organisations to be promoting uh, competing websites that are providing reviews. That's not to say that they shouldn't, but um, you see the bind that we would be in doing that. Um, I, I do take your point. You could flip this on its head and focus on the positive. I think the, the point I would make to that is yeah, sure, there might be genuine reviews out there, but actually the negative is is crowding them out because there's so much fake stuff out there. So unless you deal with that, it's actually quite hard to find the genuine stuff. That would be my view. I think we've got time for one more, and then I'll ask the panellists for their, their one thing. What is the one thing you're taking away from this discussion? Hi, this is a great panel. My name is Juan Carlos Izaguirre. I work for SIGAP, a global think and do tank housed at the World Bank. And I've been on consumer protection issues for 20 plus years. Used to be a banking supervisor, so um, yeah. Uh, I, just a couple of comments. I think, first of all, great to hear that your one of the points is financial education is not enough because this is a typical issue we've had with regulators which usually the first reaction is let's educate the consumers, but it's not enough, right? So thanks for that message. Uh, one of the challenges we're seeing on fraud is that it's, it's becoming so difficult to, to, to take action, especially by the regulators. Sometimes they're overwhelmed with, the, with what to do. So I wanted to, to ask a couple of questions. One, on commitment, whether if we, part of the work of either of your organization, but primarily which, whether you found an important entity that became the champion from the government side, or if you had to rile up that kind of effort to convince of the case to do this work. The other point is on collaboration, which is an important point for, for us on digital finance. Like, What actors do you think are the key players to be involved in this kind of, of effort, regulatory action? It's multiple regulators, it's multiple regulators plus private sector institutions, industry associations, plus consumer organizations, which would be kind of key stakeholders without which you wouldn't have been able to do this. And final point on capacity, because I think that might be the next challenge for you. And in emerging markets where we work, that's, that would be the main challenge is you may be able to put a regulation in place even, but then the enforcement of that regulation might be the next big issue. How do you make the regulation make, be effective? No? Thank you. Okay, so <clears throat> law enforcement. Um, we, in, in the UK, we have several organizations that actually want to fight fraud, but they are overwhelmed because of the quantity that is there. That is why I'm sorry that I'm sound as a broken record, but prevention is key. Because even the law enforcers are finding this very difficult to deal with. The other thing that I will say, the reason because we got the regulation, by the way, is because we work also with law enforcers in advocating for this, to show that they couldn't do this alone. On who we put around the table for that collaboration. So. In the UK, we said, well, the, you know, the Data Protection Authority, the financial regulator, the, tele what is the equivalent of the telecom regulator, Ofcom, who is the regulator that enforcement on the Online Safety Act, and of course, the businesses, the telcos, the platforms, the banks, to work together and see, in particular, on that intelligent sharing 
uh, that they, they should do to work on the prevention. On capacity, you talk about capacity, if I understood correctly, the capacity of the regulators. Huge challenge. And that is why I think, and we have heard in other panels, that the regulators, there is a, you know, a need. This is a global challenge, as many of these global issues that we are facing as a consumer issues, and regulators should work together across jurisdictions. And I know that many regulators want to do that. I mean, yesterday in one of the um, panels, the Federal Trade Commission made the same point, so they want to do that. And I think that they should get on and, and do it and see how they can work together and what they can learn from what is happening in the different jurisdictions, as we do as a consumers. All right, I think we've got one, but we'll have to keep it very brief because we've got to wrap up and I still have to launch the exciting thing. <laughs> Thank you, good morning, I'll be very brief. So mine is, 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 is not a question, but maybe a comment. Uh, my name is Jones in Taukira from Zua Energy in Malawi. So I'm very keen on this because uh, five years ago, my MBA research was actually focused on this. And uh, there were two things that we, I found that were very critical uh, when it comes to building trust for people to use digital payment platforms or digital uh, commerce platforms. And the first one was uh, society norms. So society norms, which you know, can easily be defined as uh, how we do things here or how my neighbor does their things, has like plays a very, very critical uh, role in determining if people are going to use a platform or not. And that's where I think on the part of fake reviews or reviews in general is somewhere that we need to really focus on because uh, people are easily you know, driven or swayed by what the neighbor is doing, what the neighbor is saying. So if we don't tackle that, uh, it's a big problem. And I think there are many ways that it, that could be done. For example, you know, uh, having a, a standard uh, a, a, a scoring system that d determines which review goes uh, uh, online or not. And then the second one was the issue of uh, structural assurance. Again, structural assurance also determines if people are going to use a platform or not. And in this case, it is the actual operator. Uh, it could be a telco that you know has a role to play by making sure that their platform. Uh, 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 you know, is built in such a way that it builds trust for people to use it. So things like, uh, if I get if I get scammed, for example, uh, what is the probability of me, you know, uh, reporting? How easy is it for me to uh, to go to report? Where am I going to report? If these things are clear, it it is a step, you know, ahead of uh, helping to uh, keep those things. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, so I'm going to ask all of our panellists... Sorry, that's getting ready for the, my exciting thing at the end. Uh, <laughs> so don't be too distracted. Um, John, we'll start with you. What is the one thing you have learnt or are taking away from this discussion today? I, I think there's... Uh, hopefully, a general consensus that consumers aren't actually at fault here. Sometimes they are, when they're negligent, but for the most part, they're not at fault. And when we're looking at attributing blame or liability, sure, we should start with the scammers. They're committing criminal offences, but we should follow the money. The money's going to the scammers, but it's also going to the banks who are charging fees. It's going to the telcos who are charging fees, and it's going to the platforms who receive a fee to run a fake ad. And we should keep that in mind when we're looking at attributing blame and be careful uh, around the sensitivities of making victims who have already been traumatised feel worse for the, the situation they find themselves in. So I endorse that. Um, the, for me, is that there is a huge opportunity really for all of us to work together, and it is part of the surprise. Um, <laughs> and share intelligence, share information, what we are learning when we are engaging in this debate in our jurisdictions, because this is a big problem that actually go across jurisdiction, and some of these criminals are operating from a different jurisdiction in our jurisdiction. So the opportunity to collaborate more and uh, share knowledge. Thank you. So from everybody's sentiments here, I'm gathering that um, bad sellers really know how to look good. And if left to roam the earth, they will compromise the, the integrity of, let me use internet, because I'm speaking from a browser perspective. So, and if they compromise that, then you know, the, the whole ecosystem crashes down. So we have a lot of work to preserve the integrity of the ecosystems. And by ecosystems, I mean for us as a browser, preserve that integrity for organizations, preserve the integrity. 
because that's what consumers trust at the end of the day. And as I said earlier, um, trust is the foundation that everything else is, is built upon. Thank you. For me, the key uh, point is the uh, comprehensive attitude to the issue. And um, I was listening to the discussion. I see that uh, there is a, uh, it's not only my thought on that. And also the cooperation, cooperation between business and public um, institutions and uh, cooperation worldwide is uh, needed because in the end we have the consumers that could be affected by uh, business from different parts of the, of the world. And I'm also going to share my one thing, um, which is picking up on many of the themes mentioned around um, collaboration. This is a global problem, and so really it needs a globally coordinated solution. And so I'm very, very proud to announce that my team at Choice and Helena's wonderful team at Consumers International have been working hard over the last few weeks to enable a global action by consumer groups to stop online scams. Um, if you go to that QR code, it will take you to um, the joint global statement calling on governments across the world to require technology platforms to protect consumers from online scams. The slide will take you to both the statement, and so you can read it there, um, and there's a form for any other Consumers International members who haven't already signed up to also join as signatory. We already have over 20 organisations um, as signatories and we welcome more. We are stronger together and when we sp speak with a global and united voice. Um, if you'd like to join, um, you'll need to fill out the form and send your logo. It's a very simple form. Just put down your name and send the logo. Um, and we'll include... Um, you need to do that by 5pm Sunday, UK time. And we'll include you as a signatory for the formal release of this um, statement um, next week on Monday. So I really encourage any Consumers International members who've not already joined to become a signatory. We are, like I said, strongest and loudest when we work together as a movement and this is a really exciting opportunity to join the fight to stop online scams. So, to finish things off, um, I wanted to thank our panellists for contributing to the discussion. Thank you, John, Rossio, Patrick, Agnieszka. And thank our audience for their participation and attention today. <laughs>